Look, I um, let, let me let me do this. I, I know it's late in the day and you're tired. Um, and I remember coming to these. In fact, Scott Dunaway and I used to go to these together and uh, listen to people tell us how to use, you know, goals and notes. And I've got some suggestions. And I, I, what I'd like to do is just be biographical. As they sent some questions that they like me to answer, and but I, I I'd like to open it up and in just a few minutes, and if, if you have questions, again, I'm perfectly happy to shift back into performer mode, um, but if there's things that you're really curious about, I, I'd really prefer to, uh, to address those, um, but I'm perfectly happy to do my shtick. So you, you folks will decide in a few minutes. Let me take 10 or 15 minutes and just give my background. Um, uh, graduated uh, from BYU Law School in 1984, and Three years before that, finished up my undergraduate work in political science. In, nowadays, when people are sticklers for resumes, I always have to be really careful because I didn't actually get my bachelor's degree until I was halfway through law school. Uh, apparently, I forgot to do my senior paper, and uh, they were kind of sticklers about that. So on the uh, Christmas break, I had to hurry up and do a senior paper, and then so my... I, my resume technically, or not technically, actually says I graduated from BYU undergraduate in December of 1982 and from BYU Law School in April of 1984. So people, luckily, I'm so old now, nobody pays attention to that. But uh, I was active in politics uh, from a very, very early age. I was raised mostly up in Seattle. And Washington State, when I was raised there, was really the beautiful example of where we had conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans. At one point, and some of you will remember this, we had Dan Evans, quite a liberal Republican governor, and Scoop Jackson, who was a very conservative Democrat center, senator. So there was a, a lot of overlap between the two parties, and I was raised in kind of a labor union Democratic uh, family. Uh, and the uh, my father uh, was a career military person, so was not allowed to participate in campaigns, but his father, who died before I knew him, was a, legislature, a legislator in the state of Georgia. So my father had been raised in a political family, but because of his, you know, he up until I was about uh, 12 years old, he was uh, in the military. So as a 10-year-old, he would take me to Democratic state legislative candidates that he liked, and he would walk me in as a 10-year-old and say, my son would like to volunteer. And, you know, this was a long, long time ago. I'm 60. Um, and I remember one time I handed out matchbooks for a candidate. Can you imagine doing that now? You know, vote for Bill Leckenby matchbooks in, uh, in store parking lots. But at an early age, I saw that politics gave great ego rewards for very marginal performance. And I was drawn to it. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, if you, if you have an hour a month to spend on a campaign, you get to be a block captain. And my dad had spent 24 years in the Army and only made it to a master sergeant. And, uh, and if you spend a couple hours a week, you can be in charge of block captains, which I figured was like a major or a colonel. And so I was active in campaigns uh, through high school. And uh, when I came back to, to BYU, was active in campaigns after my mission. And, and I had uh, this won't, name won't mean a lot to most of you, but my mission president up in Quebec was Wayne Owens, who had been a former Democratic member of Congress, and he was very fastidious about not talking politics, but just associating with him was one of the great formative experiences of my life, and came back and was involved in campaigns. And I went to undergraduate, I majored in political science, and I went to law school with a single focus of wanting to be involved in politics and government. I had the kind of bittersweet experience to sit in a luncheon just last week with my uh, tax professor um, who has since retired, and I just I felt so bad because I remember when I, I, I knew I'd never be involved with corporate taxes and figured if I just got a, you know, a C minus, I could graduate, and boy, I wish I'd have paid attention uh, now. Or, but uh, so I worked in politics and campaigns, and, and even in law school, I took a semester off to help run Senator Hatch's re-election campaign in 1982. And then uh, 
uh, went back to law school, and my first job out of law school was back working as the most junior attorney imaginable on the Senate Judiciary Committee. And, um, you know, I, I, again, I was so junior, I was actually doing stuff for the secretaries uh, as this young lawyer. And after a year, um, a friend by the name of Mike Levitt, uh, who was a close friend and seven years older than me, so he seemed old and wise, he said, come back to Utah and let's form a political consulting firm. And so we did. We did that for four years, and I ran Senator Hatch's re-election campaign and, uh, and Senator Garn's re-election campaign, and then we had a number of, of other U.S. Senate candidates and a, and a number of other clients. And I did that for four years up until, uh, you know, I was close to 30 years old, and I, I did something that I would recommend that you think, and, and, and I ought to be a little embarrassed about it, but, you know, I was in essence a political consultant, and I looked around as a fellow about to turn 30, and I said, how many 50-year-old, because that seemed really old to me, how many 50-year-old political consultants are there that I really can see myself wanting to be like in 20 years? And there weren't any. There were a couple that I really loved and I still keep in touch with today, but I, I didn't want to be them. And so I, uh, I told Mike Levitt, you know, I said, look, let's do this for another year to get us through the election cycle and let's wrap it up. And he said, well, if you don't want to do it anymore, I don't want to do it anymore. And so I left that job to uh, be the chief of staff to Governor Bangor. And we'd consulted on that race. And uh, he was at one point 33 percent behind. And we were able to help him coach through a, to, a, to a victory, and that was 88. And uh, so I became his chief of staff in December of 88 and did that for about three years. And for the, those three years and two years before that, there was a fellow by the name of Omar Cater that Scott and I knew and love, and, and uh, he had taken another job just before the semester started, and I got a panicked call from the department chair asking if I would... Uh, if I would fill in on teaching a class on what I don't even think they offer it anymore called political participation, political science 230. And uh, I, I think after I got done teaching it, they just realized anybody would just look bad by comparison, so they actually scratched it from the curriculum. And uh, the, uh, but I taught one year, one course a year for BYU for five years, and it was just the most enjoyable thing that I did. And so as I, as I decided I wanted to leave the chief of staff job a couple years before Governor Bangor's term finished, or a year before, and, and BYU, the political science department, uh, Dean Clayne Pope and department chair David Magleby were willing to come and give me a try as, uh, to join the faculty full time. And, and it was a real stretch for them because I will, even though technically I can be called doctor because I'm a Juris Doctorate, um, you know, PhDs see a lawyer kind of like an electrician or a plumber, but less useful to have as a neighbor. And, uh, and, but I, I loved it and I, I taught uh, for, for three years and then went back as a visiting professor at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and loved that and then came and did another year. But to go to the point made in the introduction, um, I, uh, I was doing some consulting with a New York-based company called Lucadia and they had some challenges with a variety of companies uh, running from a national bank to a f company that made movies for D the Disney Channel. And they would occasionally ask me to spend a day here or a day there to help them on some things. And they, before I left for North Carolina, they had uh, uh, expressed interest in hiring me. And I came home one night after a, a long day of teaching and, and uh, or being a, um, on the faculty and threw myself dramatically on the bed and said to my wife, Shirley, I said, I had no idea how lonely the academic life was, that it's very isolating. I don't feel like there's, I'm fully valued for the practical experience I have. Um, and I said, I just, you know, I just had a rough day. And she sat on the bed next to me and she said, Bud, I want you to remember our deal. And I said, I, I don't know what our deal is. And she said, you know, so many men your age are actually increasing their earning capacity. 
and you took two pay cuts in a row to become chief of staff and another pay cut to, uh, and she said, to be a teacher. And I said, well, I'm a professor. And she said, all right, whatever. And, uh, <laughs> and unlike now where your faculty members are paid these just ridiculously high salaries, I mean, they're fabulously wealthy. Uh, um, and, uh, but they were really quite miserly back when I was teaching. And, uh, and so she sat on the bed next to me and she said, so many men your age are actually increasing their earning capacity. And she said, and I've never complained. And I said, until now. And she said, well, I'm not complaining, but here's the deal. She said, you can either come home isolated, alienated, undervalued, and well compensated, or you better be the happiest teacher, I'm sorry, professor in the world because I will not be married to an unhappy, poorly compensated man. And I sat up and I said, you're not kidding. And she said, no, I'm not, I'm very serious. She said, I, and she took care of all, she still takes care of all the money in our household. And uh, she just said, that's the deal. You're either a happy uh, member of the political science faculty or you can be unhappy and do something and be well compensated. And I literally got off the bed called the chairman of this New York Stock Exchange traded company and said, I'd like to talk to you about coming to work for you. And they flew me out that weekend and uh, finished up my teaching obligations and went to work with Lucadia National, L-U-K, on the New York Stock Exchange. And, um, and it's pertinent to the questions that were prescribed. So I had no business background. I had not paid attention in tax and law school. I'd never had an accounting class. I'd never had a business class. Um, I knew that I was going to be active in politics and government, so why dirty your hands with that stuff? And they, Lucadia hired me, and, uh, and, I, and what Lucadia did was bought distressed companies, undervalued companies, and turned them around. So sometimes we mess them up more, but our goal was to turn them around. And... Uh, they asked me to come run this film company that was making movies for Disney and, and worked through that for them. And, um, and then one day, Joe Steinberg, the president of Lucadia, was in Salt Lake, and he said, you have two choices. You can either take over our two banks or you can move back to New York, but the film company's wrapping up and you're not going to make a career of that. And I, I didn't want to move again. We just moved three times in three years. And so... I uh, said, well, I'll do the banks. And the next day, the chairman of the company called me into his office. And he said, I understand my partner wants you to run the two banks. And I said, yes. And he said, bud, he said, you know that I know that you're a smart guy. And I said, well, thank you. And he said, but in meetings with other Lucadia executives, when you confuse revenue with income, he said, I know at a theoretic level you understand the difference, but it is a real distraction. And he said, I just called your wife an hour ago and told her that we were going to be docking your bonus if you didn't hire an accounting tutor. And we'll pay for it, but you've got to learn the language of accounting. And they actually flew the CFO out, and he took me to dinner, and I still remember he had a doer's scotch in front of him. Was he sipping while we were looking at the menu, and he said... Look, uh, the chairman and the president of Lucadia want me to come out and give you some accounting assistance. This is the CFO of a New York Stock Exchange traded company. And he said, I, I don't know how remedial I'm supposed to get. He said, you, do you understand dual entry accounting? And I said, well, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because how is it that assets always equal exactly liabilities? I mean, come on. And he mo mo motioned to the waitress and said, I'll need another scotch. And uh, so I hired, uh, I, I was, got tutored, and then I called Harvard Business School and said, find me a, uh, an analyst that wants to work in Salt Lake. And, and uh, they found a great guy by the name of Randy Jensen. And that name is significant in the sense that he became a job description at Lucadia. And because I'd known them before I went to work there, I didn't spend any calories trying to pretend to be something I wasn't. And so that back before you could email files, Randy and I would literally late into the night sit next to a desktop computer and I would do the narrative and he would do the spreadsheets and he was just a poet 
uh, on Excel. I mean, it, it just, his stuff was so beautiful and so clear. And so at the first, they started having quarterly review business meetings, and I brought Randy right with me and had him sit next to me, and they looked at it. They looked at our report on the bank, and they said, tell us about the sensitivity analysis on loan rate to loss ratio. And I explained it theoretically because I'd, I knew what I wanted to test for, and then Randy explained how he built the chart. And the next week, I started getting calls from all the other CEOs saying, what in the blank is a Randy Jensen? And I told them, and they all weren't interested. And so six months later, I was called into the chairman's office, and they said, and, um, there was a guy, John Rosenberger, sitting there, and he said, but you know John, he heads up our plastics division, and they had plants in Georgia and Minneapolis and Belgium. It was a big company. And he said, you know, John, and I said, yeah, and he goes, and you probably see that John's unhappy right now. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, John, I hope I didn't have anything to do with that. And he said, well, the chairman said you did because John's now reporting to you. Um, we want the kind of insight and analytics that you've done at the bank, and so now find another CEO for the bank, but we want you to be responsible for the bank and the plastics division. And within six months later, I was responsible for all of the operating companies at Lucadia, which included a copper mine uh, in Spain, uh, an uh, insurance company in Argentina, wineries in California, a um, couple of banks, a um, couple of manufacturing companies, uh, uh, a property and casualty insurance company in New York City, and a uh, long-haul fiber optic cable company in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And by then, I'd had about 11 of these MBAs, a couple from BYU that did fantastic, and a few from other graduate schools around the country, and, and, and we kind of changed the way this entire company did their reporting and visualization and of the results, and I produced a monthly book, and pretty soon they stopped having quarterly meetings and started having semi-annual meetings and then just annual meetings because they had a book that even a guy like me could understand. Um, and uh, that was my career at Lucadia. In the last four years or five years I was there, I was traveling 180 nights a year. Um, and, uh, and if you do the math, you know, there's, I, I, I was always home on weekends because I was a, a bishop at a university singles ward. But I was, so that meant I was gone almost all of the other weeknights. Um, I explained to my daughter Emma, who's here, that er, early on that, Putting family first is really just an expression, uh, and uh, the uh, but I was just burnt out after 12 years of working at Lucadia, and I went to um, to the chairman and to the president, and I said, "Look, you folks have been really good to me, and I don't want to be sneaking around, um, but uh, I want to see if I can go back. I feel like I want to go back and work with young people again and get the college age folks." And they said I was out of my, they used some vernacular, and, but they said, why don't you take a look for a few months and see if there's something that really attracts you and, you know, work on your succession planning. And I spent a few months looking around at opportunities and then got called in and asked to serve as a mission president. And uh, in July of 2007, it's funny that revelation is really, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, or, but I'm very sincere about this, Re revelation is a dull instrument. Um, you know, you feel this gnawing sense that you need to be working with college-aged young people. And I just assumed it meant returning to the university, but that's not what heaven had in mind. And while Scott was laboring in Italy, I was in Australia. And I remember calling him once and saying, what are you doing with your missionaries? He said, well, this is just done away. He said, we're really committed to our missionaries having a rich cultural experience. And so we make sure that every one of them gets to an opera. Right? Was it at La Scala or just any opera? Any opera. You know, while they're missionaries. And I thought, man, that's a really good idea. And so I bought uh, 14 season passes to rugby <laughs> and got uh, uh, all of our missionaries to a rugby game every year. I figured that was the equivalent. But loved serving in Sydney and came home and did a, uh, I didn't, uh, you know, I, I didn't feel right about going back to Lucadia. They were very kind to me and I'm still on a board of directors for them over in Italy, so I get to go to Rome every, every three months. And, and, uh, but uh, I, spent a, I did a six-month project for a, uh, 
a New York private equity company that, you know, that had a problem in Chicago, and I did that, and then I did a six-month project with the Huntsman family to get their private holdings in better shape, and then got an offer to go back to Perth. The last deal I worked on at Lucadia before being called as a mission president to Sydney was to get a, do a startup iron ore mine in Western Australia, and the, the founder of that, who was now worth $6 billion, um, you know, Lucadia made over $2 billion uh, in five years on a $400 million investment, and they send me a fruit basket every year and thank me for that. And uh, But uh, so I went, I moved to Perth. Um, uh, this would have been in uh, July of 2011. And... Uh, worked for 18 months in Perth, and then it just, it just turns out that a, a professional adventure in Perth, Australia, just ends up feeling way different than, a, than being in the Lord's service in Sydney. And, and even though I had a lot more flexibility, and when I'd worked there about 18 months, um, my wife came down, came, she was, went back to the U.S. to get Emma settled into school, Emma pretty much wrecked this professional opportunity for me, and uh, the no, she was she she was inspired, and sure she'd been to three high schools in three years, and her mother said, for your senior year, if you want to go back to Salt Lake and go to high school there for your senior year, can you can do it? And then she turned to me and she said, Bud, we're not going to do what you usually do and pretend to let Emma make her decision. She's going to make her own decision. And then she decided to go back, so Shirley went back to get her settled in school and flew back the Friday before General Conference. And in Australia, they show General Conference a week after because of the time differences. And I was in the Western Australia Mission Presidency and had a, a branch meeting I had to go to. And I picked her up and or I picked up Shirley and I said, look, we've got a three-hour drive and I'm just going to listen. I said, I know you have some concerns, so we got three hours, and you just open your heart and don't worry about offending me. And I still remember as the garage door closed, she said, all right, there's three points I want to make. She said, number one, this is not the kind of marriage I signed up for. And she said, we've been separated three times for over four weeks. Um, and, and I said, well, I, I know that's been hard. And she used a phrase I'd never heard before. She said, it's on the wrong side of hard. She said, it's become easy. Um, I go back to Utah for four or five weeks. I become a single mother, single grandmother. You stay in Australia and become the indispensable executive that can work 14-hour days without the burden of family. And she said, I'm not worried about how hard it's become. I'm worried about how easy it's become. She said, number two, you still have three unmarried children. And I said, well, I, I, I call every one of them every week. And she said, if you think you can be a good father over the phone, you are kidding yourself. And she said, my third point is, she said, I am embarrassed to say this to you, but I would make those first two work if you were truly happy. But I can tell that you're not truly happy, and it's finished. And I said, the job? And she goes, yes, the job, you know, not the marriage. And, uh, and, uh, and, and then she turned to me and she said, we're not even on the freeway yet. What will we talk about? And uh, so we went down into the branch conference, and this, some of this was a long time ago, but it was the conference of President Uchtdorf's talk about regrets and resolutions. And Shirley had downloaded it onto her phone, and we were listening to it as we drove back from this branch. And after President Uchtdorf's talk on regrets and resolutions, she reached over and pressed pause and said, I'm curious how it feels that he had to take everybody in the church's time to deliver a message that only you needed to hear. And I said, oh, come on, yeah, you're piling on. So that was on a Sunday, and we went to the temple on Wednesday, and I quit on Thursday. And they asked me to stay through December, which I did, and came back and didn't know what I was going to do next. I was still on, was on three boards of directors in Australia, which they kept me on. I was on a board in Italy. And, and then a good friend of mine, <clears throat> Randy Quarles, who... Uh, will be sworn in this week. He's, he's, he was not a partner as of 5 p.m. yesterday. He's going to be the vice chair of the uh, Federal Reserve. Um, and so he's back in Washington, D.C. doing that. But Randy is the son-in-law of the Eccles family, and, and uh, he and I had been talking for about seven years about doing something together. So in 2000, late 2013, early 2014, we formed Sinusure, 
which um, is a private equity firm and wealth advisory, <coughs> and uh, the um, and so what I spend most of my time is what's called private equity, where we look to buy. Uh, and unlike most private equity, we're not a fund. Um, what we prefer to do is to buy minority positions and have a long time horizon. So typically, where we're valuable is when, like for example, one of our companies had one founding partner that was 70 and one that was 50, and the 70-year-old wanted to retire and the 50-year-old didn't, but the 50-year-old couldn't afford to buy out the 70-year-old, so we bought him out, and we've done that on four or five <coughs> situations. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap up with one example of what we do. When we were first, before we had an office or business cards or anything else, in fact, Randy was still living in Washington, D.C. as a partner at Carlisle, the biggest private equity firm in the world, and he called me and said, hey, we've got an opportunity. Some people I know have never done direct investment, you know, private equity before, and they don't want to do it on their own, but they'll do it with us, and they have two companies they want us to look at. One is a company that does inventory software for national retailers, and the other is Burger King. He's a Burger King franchisee that has 50 Burger Kings and wants to expand, and so... Uh, we said, meet me in Atlanta next week, and so we met, and his flight was late, and we were late getting to the restaurant, and we didn't have assistance or itineraries or anything else, and so we sit down, and the guy is, was kind of a, a very nice upscale chain, and he said, I hope this restaurant's okay, and I said, you know, when I'm in Atlanta, I prefer to eat at Crystal's Burger, and he said, well, Crystal's Burger is nothing more than the southern equivalent of Blue Castle, or White Castle. And I said, oh, if you think that, you haven't really studied both, different menus, different value propositions. The only thing they have in common is small hamburgers, but I really think you're missing the differentiators. And we started arguing back and forth, and he excused himself to go to the restroom. And in 40 years, it's the only time I've seen my partner mad at me. He said, what are you doing waxing poetic about Crystal's Burgers with a Burger King guy? And I said, I thought it was a software guy. <laughs> he said, no, this is the Burger King guy. They're so brand conscious. I said, I'm sorry, I, I thought it was the software guy. And he comes back, and there was no digging myself out, so we argued about the proper fry temperature oil, fry oil temperature. And then we went and to the computer software guy that would just, it just wasn't an interesting investment at all. And so then we meet this big billionaire family office that had invited us, and they specifically didn't want to attend the meetings because they wanted objective reviews. And I remember in this very nice lobby, they come out, and they say hi to Randy, and they turn to me, and they said, you must be Bud Scruggs. And I said, yes. And they said, well, Tom Garrett called about your lunch. And Randy kind of said, yeah, I'm sure he did. Um, what did he have to say? And he said that in uh, 25 years of working with bankers that Bud Scruggs is the first one he's ever met that actually cares about fast food and he wants you guys to do the deal with them. And, uh, <laughs> and so we did it. Now they have 400 restaurants and we bought 200 in December. And when we did the due diligence, me and Tom Garrett, the CEO, we divided it up into three. So we visited 65 Burger Kings in three days. And on the first day that we started in Florida and ended up in New Orleans and uh, as you can tell, I'm a goal setter, and so I set a goal on the first day to eat something at all 16 Burger Kings we visited. Not, not a value meal or something, but, you know, like the breakfast burrito at one and the waffle sticks at the second one and a mango smoothie at the next one, and, and uh, did that through 16 or 17 Burger Kings. And at the end of three and a half days, somebody from Burger King Corporate called Tom and said, well, how's your due diligence going? And he said, well, I got this guy Bud Scruggs with me that tested food quality at 16 Burger Kings on Monday and the plumbing at 20 on Tuesday. And uh, anyway, so th those are the kind of things that we're, in, we're involved in, and, and uh, that's the weird, twisted course that I took. So what, what kind of, what's on your mind? What kind of questions do you have? How can, how can I be responsive? Is this water for me, or? Sure. No, so even if it isn't. <laughs> Nothing on your minds? What do you come here hoping to learn? Yeah. So over your time, you've built up your network. You know all these different people. What's been the most effective way of kind of maintaining contact with people, not, not interfering too much in their lives and making them feel like you're just constantly working to get things out of them, but not letting them kind of be forgotten about? Kind of well, it's, it's a lot easier now with, uh, you know, with email. I mean, I keep in mind, I started my career before there was email, and... Uh, but I, I, I do spend a lot of time at it. 
Uh, I, I spend less time at it now, but but I would go, you know, and, and again, the, the, the key thing, people can tell if you see them as a means to the end. If you see people as tools as opposed to individuals, they can feel it. And so talking about mentoring, I remember when I was on, on the faculty here, then Elder Irene gave a talk on mentoring. And if you can, I think you can still Google it and listen to it, but he, he said something that just was seared into my mind. He, in fact, I think the talk was to find and keep a mentor. And he said, if you value praise more than criticism, you are likely to get neither. And I've learned that the most valuable thing I can do, I love the fact that I worked with two New York legends in the deal business that up until I was 50 when I left were still willing to call me up and say, I don't think this was your best work. You can do better than this. And you don't find that very often. Um, but you have to be welcoming of the feedback. So I, but I spent a lot of time at it. And, and, uh, and sometimes they had time and sometimes they didn't and, and uh, worked hard to keep in touch, but it's, it's important. And, and, uh, but, but part of it is that you, you, know, you, you have to be genuinely interested in them as individuals. And secondly, you know, my career has really been a series of benign betrayals, all right? Um, really successful people are very good at keeping people working for them that could do better elsewhere, all right? They're masters at it. And uh, when, when I got to the point that I felt I had learned all I could from a mentor, I left. I went and found another mentor. That's, I, I, I made my employment decisions based on what I could learn from individuals, not by any other. That was the primary factor. And I, I let me share one spiritual experience that that most of my spiritual experiences have come in the forms of rebukes. Um, I don't know if anybody else has had that experience, but um, I was uh, offered a job about halfway through my Lucadia tenure, and the, the starting offer was a million dollars a year and 10% and equity of the company. And if I would have taken that job, um, it probably would have been worth $100 million dollars. To me personally, not the company, just to me personally. And Shirley and I prayed about it and fasted about it and, and went to the temple. And, and I couldn't, you know, one of the things that a, a dear friend once said to me one time, because I, it was after Perth, where I just felt it just had been a mistake to do the whole Perth thing. And I was embarrassed. Emma knows, you know, for like six weeks afterwards, I just kind of stayed in the house and kept borrowing her car. And Shirley said, you got to get a car. And I said, I... I don't deserve a car. <laughs> and she said, okay, you don't deserve a new car, but you have to quit using Emma's car. And, and then she just went out and bought a car. And, but I was, you know, I just really felt embarrassed. And I went to a friend and I said, I said, you know, I prayed and fasted and did everything I was supposed to do on this Perth job. And he said, well, how did you put it to heaven? And I said, I asked for permission. He said, oh, that's so dumb. And I said, why? And he said, he said, look, he said, if a, a, a righteous individual asks heaven per, for permission, if he's asking to do something that is unrighteous, the answer will always be no, but any other question will always be yes. He's, heaven's as happy to have you learn from mistakes that you make with your best judgment as anything else. But on this, this job that I turned down, we're sitting in the temple, this is, you know, years before that, and... I turned to Shirley and I said, you know, I said, you and I made a commitment to each other when we were living in a mobile home as undergraduates that we would never, ever have me take a job because of money. And I said, it served us well till now. Let's not change. And I turned down the job and then in, if I'd have taken it three years later, it would have been a $100 million payday. And... Uh, and when I sought guidance on a, another career decision, in fact, and I, I, again, I'm just so embarrassed I did this, but, you know, Shirley said, well, should we fast and go to the temple again? And I said, the last time we did it, it cost me $100 million. And I felt the spirit withdraw from me um, like I've never felt it before. Uh, and I, I probably spent 
eight months repenting from that single comment, not because it was a comment, but because it was something that I'd harbored. So that's a, that's a long, twisted answer to your question. What else? I'll try to be shorter on the next one. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, first of all, all right, and I'm just going to shoot straight, nobody cares about your work-life balance except you and your wife, and you just got to, or your family, you just got to, nobody cares about it, and even if they pretend they care, they don't care, and nothing's more aggravating when you're trying to hire somebody for a key position, and they lecture you about work-life balance. I mean, I, 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 you got to be your own steward. And Elder Bednar gave the best explanation of it. He said that you get every, up every morning and you ask yourself between family, work, and church, which is the most out of whack, was the phrase he used. And you work on it until it's not out of whack. And then he said, look, job tends to be self-reinforcing. Um, and church tends to adjust. You know, I'm a bishop in my home ward now, and, and it makes demands on me. I don't have to set time aside. It sets time on its own. And, but, you, you know, you really rely on a good husband or wife to help you be anchored when it's getting too far out of whack. But, you know, I remember a friend of mine who was working in a very demanding job, um, you know, went to see his religious leader because his wife's parents felt like he was spending too much time at work. And... Uh, this very senior religious leader said, how old are you? And he said about, you know, he said 30. And he said, well, this is the time of life you make a name for yourself. You have to make sacrifices. And, I mean, the, the, it's, again, the, the uh, and but believe it or not, there's, I know there's a lot to the millennial stuff, but it, it was true 100 years ago. Um, I mean, they actually have census data that shows it's true 100 years ago about the number of job changes and, and you just got to find your own balance and hope you have a spouse that helps keep you tethered, but also hope you have a spouse that realizes that there are trade-offs. And, you know, I have a son that I love dearly. I have two sons, Elliot and David, both. They made the decision when they were in college that they were not willing to make the sacrifices I've made. They talked about it openly. And they both, you know, make, you know, enough, enough money to support their families. They both live within their means. And, and they know, they understand the trade-offs. And I'm proud of them. Yeah, I, I really am. And anyway, so, whether there's another question in the back? Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, as far as, you know, work ethic and working in business and also in the church, and also um, the practices here, uh, was there any one habit or practice in your work life that brought you the most success? Okay, uh, y yes, but it, 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 it's a, it's a window into my weakness more than, I, I don't want to try to pass this off as a strength, okay, because it's not. Um, um, I would work two nights a week until two in the morning, and I'd work a half a day every Saturday, and every other night I'd work until about eight o'clock, except for Monday night I got home for family home evening, and Wednesday night... It, you know, I, I was an elders quorum president at one point, but I, I, you know, I made adjustments there. But I, um, I, I, and when I would work late, you know, at about 10 o'clock, you get into the zombie stage. And you guys all know that. I mean, what am I telling? What, you guys know about this. I, I remember when I taught here during finals, you know, everybody comes and, you know, their faces have all broken out and their hair's matted down and greasy. And, the, and uh, you guys know what it's like to do that. But so I just kept that going. And, and, you know, I just, I remember, I'm not a great memorizer of poetry, but I just remembered one, the heights that great men sought and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, were upwards toiling in the night. And, uh, um, I just, I, I, again, this is not, I, again, you know, I'm not going to pass myself off as humble. The fact is I flat outworked people that were smarter and more disciplined than me. And that may sound nutty, um, but I just flat outworked them. And the, the biggest valuable thing I took away from my undergraduate e education is I learned how to write. 
and I learned how to write succinctly and in bullet points. And as you all know, James Madison is known as the father of the Constitution because he's the guy that showed up with a rough draft. And I found early in my career, I would go to my boss and say, look, you know, I, I know this is overreaching and you probably don't need this, but I know you've got this big meeting tomorrow. Um, and I, I just put together what I thought would be a useful agenda. And, and he goes, oh, well, thank you. And I said, you know, I, I know I wasn't invited to it, but if, if you want me to, to be to be there, I'd be happy to take notes. And I would get invited and take notes, and by 8 o'clock the next morning, I would have a draft memo that he could send out, and I'd apologize. I'd say, like, this is really, you know, you probably don't want this, but here's a memo, a follow-up memo on yesterday's meeting, and if you don't use it, that's, that's fine, but here it is. And they always used it, and, or yeah, they'd change it and make it better. But the ability to reduce talk to paper um, both in terms of planning and follow-up, was the big differentiator for me. And, and, and the other one, it, it, it turns out God made lots of smart people. There, there's no shortage, shortage of smart people. Um, but the scarce commodity in business um, and, and politics and government is judgment. And, you got, and it takes a lot of courage and a lot of work um, to have it, but that's the real scarce commodity, the ability to reduce talk to paper and to show that you have good judgment. And, and you, you develop really good judgment by seeking corrective counsel, um, and even though it's painful. Yes? Um, going along, along with that, how did you use your background in politics um, and in government into your portrait type of service? Um, or did you? No, I did, and, and, it, and, it's, and it was actually easier. I, I, one of my sons is an accountant, and he's frustrated. And, you know, I said to him, I said, David, when, when I was in politics, people would always say, we need to run government like a business. And the fact is, most businesses are not, like run, are not run like a business. <laughs> they're, they're not. And, and uh, so I, my rise at Lucadia, which, again, is, it, it, they kept a very low profile, didn't do media interviews, but it's one of the most famous turnaround companies in, world, in the world. And uh, what I found is to, to be unafraid to ask obvious questions um, and to keep asking. And, and you know, the, somebody, this is not original to me by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the policy of the five whys, okay, W-H-Y. And you keep asking why until you get to the root cause. And, and again, I, 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 went, I got parachuted into a property casualty company headquartered in Brooklyn. I mean, my CFO was named Rocco Natoli. How cool is that, okay? He looked like he was right off the set of Sopranos, not that I've ever seen it. Um, but um, but I, I remember I sat there once and got all the department heads in, and I said, look, if you guys want to play stump the dummy with me on property and casualty assurance, it will be a really short game, and you will win, and I will be working here when you're not. And I said, I'm going to ask a lot of basic questions. I said, here's what I know about property and casualty insurance. On a good year, the amount you take in on premiums should be more than what you pay out in losses. I said, other than that, I don't know. So please don't use jargon with me. Don't use acronyms, and do not ever tell me that's the way it's done. And I remember I went and sat in the underwriting department. Everybody in these cubicles, and I asked who the best underwriter. First of all, I asked the head of underwriting, how long does it take to underwrite a property and casualty policy? He said, golly, I have no idea. All right, that's a really bad sign. And so I went and sat in a cubicle with a very bright woman for about four hours. And I said, just please let me work with you as you underwrite policies. And I called them back. I called the managers together afterwards, and I said, uh, I said, I'm sorry, were clay tablets not available? I said, that's the only technology that's worse than what you're using with these poor underwriters. And, we, and I just asked, why? Why are you doing this way? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And on property and casualty, we, we were just losing money on a, a line of car insurance. And you, you know what the second best predictor, first of all, for car, the, the likelihood to have an accident, what's the best predictor? No, okay, well, past driving record, even within an age group. 
past driving record is the best predictor of whether or not you'll have an accident. If you've had one before, you're more likely to have one in the future. The second best predictor is credit score. People that are lousy at managing their finances turn out to be reckless in other ways. And you can't not accept somebody as an insurance customer based on their credit score. But this company had shifted to allow people to pay their, their car insurance monthly. And if you've got somebody that, that can't afford to do at least semi-annual car insurance payments, you have a problem. And we just quit taking monthly payments. First we shifted it back to quarterly, then to semi-annually. And the risk rate just dropped like a rock. But it, I, I didn't come in there with that knowledge. I just kept asking why, well, why, why, why? And then, and then you try to summon up the courage to act on it. So hey, I think we're about out of time, but any other questions or I'm happy to stick around afterwards, yeah. Let me ask you one that comes up with political science students a lot, and that is you went to law school. You're technically a lawyer. You never practiced I've law. never, never built an hour. Why go to law school? Would you advise students to go to law school? What are the questions students should be asking about law school? Okay. P people love to tell lawyer jokes. They love to demean lawyers. They love to have lawyers working with them. And it is just great training. And, uh, and, I, and it was offensive the first week at law school where they kept telling us they were going to teach us how to think like a lawyer. But thinking like a lawyer or thinking like an economist uh, are, are really a good skill set. And I've, I've always been, and again, at law school is a discipline in writing and sharpening your writing. And, you know, <laughs> it's the, because I took a semester off, back then they offered spring and summer terms. In order to catch up with my class, I had to take every class they offered in spring and summer term. And I had this crusty professor that I'd had for first year torts, um, which just means, you know, suing people over hurting you or damaging you. And he was teaching, and I really disliked it, and I didn't like him. But he taught one of the summer classes, and I had to take it. It was in workers' compensation. I mean, which is just, you know, anyway, it's just t terrible. And the first day of class, he announces something that you never hear in law school, that um, your grade is going to be based 30% on class participation. Nobody does that. And the second week, he said, you know, if somebody has, I think the question is, if somebody has a nervous breakdown at work, is it covered under workers' compensation? And I said, well... I said, it's not one of the listed illnesses, and if it's not one of the listed illnesses, because workers' comp only covers the illnesses that are listed, then it would have to be an injury, and I guess you'd have to show that it was an injury. And he grumped, he said, that's not an A answer. That's not a B answer. I don't even think it was a C answer. And I just got done working on a really tough campaign, and I just said, well, hey, maybe it wasn't a great question. And he just took my head off. You know, you better learn to control your tongue because someday a judge may ask you a not great question. And he was right. I was wrong. And I just hunkered down, and it was the only final that the night before Shirley and I went to a movie. I knew I was sunk. I mean, if you, you start off with a 30% hole, you're dead. And the three-hour final, and again, I'm not making this up. I was done 90 minutes before the next person came out of that room. And the same term I took the constitutional issues of family law that Bruce Hafen taught. And on that one, I didn't expect a grade. I thought I'd get an invite to co-author a book. And I get my grades, and I got, you know, a good A- minus from Professor Hafen, and I got a grade that was so high in workers' comp, I got to actually go to the awards banquet and got given a horn book. And this, so I actually went to the registrar, and I said, like, I know this is no big deal because it all washes out, but I think you swapped my two grades. And you can imagine the look I got. She goes and gets the file, and she said, no, they were right. So the first day of my third year of law school, I'm coming in from the parking lot, and the professor's coming in at the same time, and he says, Mr. Scruggs, I couldn't help but knowing, but notice that you did considerably better in workers' comp than you did on torts. 
And I'm curious as to how you did that since they're basically, workers' comp is just simply uh, the uh, statutory torts. Can you explain the difference in your performance? And I said, yes. I said, I realized partway through the class that you didn't care about analysis. And he stopped and said, that is exactly right. In torts and workers' compensation, either the facts are there or they're not there, and all the analysis in the world doesn't change the facts. And then he got even on the first day of the first year torts class. He said, anybody that wants to know the secret of doing well, go see Mr. Scruggs. This is his Carol number. And I got back to my Carol, and there were like two, you know, 25 people waiting to get my outline. So anyway, I took too much time, but thank you, and I'll stick around afterwards. Thanks. Thank you.